Hi, I'm Asha. I'll be joining you to learn more about Nature-Based Solution, our central theme for this brand new season. During the year, we'll discover initiatives by innovators all around the world who are working with nature to fight climate change. Welcome to Switzerland. Today we are halfway between the cities of Geneva and Lausanne on the banks of Lac Léman. It's a site of natural beauty, but also home to an important center of environmental research, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. The IUCN is a global organization that works across the board to help preserve biodiversity. It has some 16,000 scientists and experts on hand to help with its work. So it's the perfect place to come for some expert advice throughout today's show. Nowadays, everyone talks about climate change, right? And it's easy to agree that there are some problems on several fronts, but we are much less able to agree on what to do about it all. Scientists are now exploring nature-based solutions. But can NBS really change the game? And what are they, actually? Coming up on this episode, we meet the game changers. From those helping to protect Australia's Great Barrier Reef. Every time I go to a reef, I get inspired. I see something new every time I visit them. To a Dutch company that has some novel solutions to human-made coastal erosion. To work with nature instead of against nature, you can see that you can have great results. And we hear from a pioneer of nature-based solutions in Europe. I'm heading his way right now, but in the meantime, here are some fast facts about nature-based solutions and why you should care. Hurricanes, heat waves, wildfires, extreme weather conditions such as these forced a record 7 million people from their homes in the first six months of 2019. The average global temperature today has risen 1 degree Celsius since pre-industrial times. And between 2015 to 2018, the warmest temperatures were recorded. The World Meteorological Organization suggests this is climate change. According to the UN, human-made greenhouse gas emissions from electricity, transportation and agriculture are responsible for more than half of the problem. A problem that could be mitigated by increasing the use of sustainable energy. But this goal remains elusive. Fortunately, a new approach that harnesses the forces of nature has come to the attention of scientific researchers nature-based solutions to restore natural ecosystems damaged by human activity. Nature-based solutions provide multiple benefits all at the same time. They can be done without having to use concrete and without having to use steel and without having to use extractive resources that require energy to produce. Nature-based solutions can also help combat the negative effects of climate change by copying natural processes, restoring forests to recapture human-generated CO2 losses, creating urban green areas, thus reducing potentially dangerous air pollution. Invest in parks. They are able to capture the amount of rain. At the same time, that park, once again, offers the opportunity to serve as an area for leisure, and it also provides an opportunity through the process of evapotranspiration to actually cool the surrounding area. Along shorelines, preserve barrier reefs to prevent erosion and coastal flooding. Using sustainable and renewable building materials in construction to improve energy efficiency. Taken together, these activities could also generate a great business opportunity with economic growth and new jobs. Maybe easy, obvious, but exciting to adopt. So, are nature-based solution a way to transition from climate crisis to sustainability? What do you think? Stewart Maganis, a 25-year veteran in the field of energy conservation, is developing practical guidance for nature-based solutions that can be deployed on a large scale. Hi, Stuart. How Hi, are you? Asha. How are you? 
So, Stuart, tell me, how are NBS approaches different, you know, from traditional ones? So, nature-based solutions are rooted in the benefits that nature provides. Real, tangible benefits like sequestering carbon, um, stabilising soil, regulating water flow. They, they come from well-managed or restored ecosystems, so, uh, such as forests, wetlands, grasslands. So healthy or restored ecosystems are at the heart of nature-based solutions. The value of nature-based solutions is that they are ready to be deployed now, particularly when we look at the context of climate change. But even with the best will in the world, decommissioning power stations, shifting to electric vehicles, uh, refitting homes, will take time, and that's time we don't have. So nature-based solutions act as a real, effective, and readily available complement to the other actions that we need to take. It's not a reason not to take those actions. In fact, it's a bridging mechanism to help us get safely to a 1.5 degree future. So what are the shortfalls and challenges in the implementation of NBS initiatives? Well, there are three major challenges, and IUCN has actually done some work to try and understand this. The first, as we've discussed, is really making sure that nature-based solutions are rolled out at scale, that at a landscape, at a watershed, that there is sufficient, it is at a scale that can actually really tap in and benefit from all those goods and services that nature delivers. The second thing is because we are working at scale, we need to make sure that different policies align. And the third thing, which is very important, is not to think of nature-based solutions as an alternative to or as a standalone solution, but really as a complement to existing um, approaches. I would also say that most important for nature-based solutions is they have got to connect with the people who are the beneficiaries and the people who will actually deliver the, the uh, solution. Are there situations where NBS can be used to mitigate the impact of uh, fossil fuels? Absolutely. In fact, this is one of the key and immediate roles for nature-based solutions. So what nature-based solutions can do and what, where they are ready for deployment now is nature-based solutions can be rolled out to sequester the carbon that is being emitted to give us a, a bridging mechanism from a fossil fuel dependent economy to a low carbon economy. Some estimates reckon that within the next 10 years, nature-based solutions will be 37% of that solution to help us get from where we are now to a low-carbon uh, future. Fantastic. Next up, the Great Barrier Reef, where we'll meet some innovators who are striving to restore the health of the world's largest coral reef ecosystem. Because the more that we educate, the more hope we've got of changing the problems we face on this planet today. We can have fabulous reefs in the future. Welcome back to Sustainable Energy. In Australia, nature-based solutions are being used to preserve the Great Barrier Reef, a key component of marine life and a natural protection against floods and coastal erosions. Australia's Great Barrier Reef is the world's biggest coral reef, a living ecosystem that stretches 250 kilometres and comprises of 900 continental islands and 300 coral keys. But it's more than just beautiful, it's actually a nature-based solution on a grand scale, protecting people and the coastline from the elements. The research that my team does is to predict how do reefs respond to climate change and how can the management that people implement take us on a better path. This is why, in 2015, the Australian government launched its 2050 Long-Term Sustainability Plan for protecting and managing the Great Barrier Reef with a budget of half a billion Australian dollars. The first project I was conducting with the Great Barrier Reef Foundation was an initiative to try and build some understanding of the reef's resilience. And one of the things I was quite proud of that the project achieved was to understand how connected the Great Barrier Reef is. We found that if you can act to protect a relatively small and manageable number of reefs, the ability for that benefit to then translate 
to affect half of the Great Barrier Reef is considerable. Through the Great Barrier Reef Foundation, Professor Mumby is also supporting the restoration of Lady Elliot Island and many others. Because, he says, if you can return the islands to their original glory, the benefits that will follow could be amazing. So one of the things that's happening, say, at Lady Elliot is a really bold restoration of the forests and the vegetation on the islands. And of course, that will then help attract and retain some of the natural birds and other animals that use that island. And we're only just beginning to understand the links between having a healthy vegetation on an island and, and how that benefits the fish and other things offshore. Lady Elliot Island is a highly protected green zone with its own nature-based solutions, a sanctuary for more than 1,200 species of marine life. But 40 years ago, this verdant ecosystem was bare rock, stripped of its foliage by decades of mining for guano. In 1987, Peter Gash came for the diving, fell in love with the island, and opened an eco-tourist resort that today creates 100% of its own energy. When we came here, we saw two separate ecosystems, the marine ecosystem and the, what we call the terrestrial ecosystem or the island, the dry land. But as we recovered this, we discovered the marine ecosystem was getting better. So we asked, why? Why is it getting better? Here we've now got a, a circular ecosystem. The birds go out there, they fish, they come back here, they live, they poop, they die, they rot, they cycle back out in there, and then they recreate in that ecosystem. So it's a closed loop. It's a remarkable thing to see one of these coral caves do that. This brilliant ecosystem today is not just a tourist haven. It also serves as a reef education centre where visitors can learn about the environment of the region. We must educate people. We owe it to people to help them to learn. Someone taught me to fall in love with this, so I need to teach you how to fall in love with a place like this and your place at home and where you want to be. Because the more that we educate, the more hope we've got of changing the problems we face on this planet today. Every time I go to a reef, I get inspired. I see something new every time I visit them. And although a lot of people are very sort of dejected about the state of our planet and the prognosis, I'm absolutely optimistic that if we can continue to move the climate change in the right direction and combine that with local actions, we can have fabulous reefs in the future. Stuart, you're actually working on similar projects and uh, the Great Barrier Reef is not the only threat in ecosystem. There are only about, at the best estimate, about 14 million hectares of mangroves uh, worldwide. They're disappearing at 2% per year. And yet mangroves, apart from having a lot of importance for biodiversity conservation in their own right, Mangroves are the archetypal nature-based solution. It certainly is not only a solution that's put in place and sits there, it's a solution that adapts and adapts to the changes and improves in its resilience over time. From an economic perspective, are NBS cheaper and more efficient? There is definitely several studies that actually show that nature-based solutions are economically very competitive. Watershed management in Idaho, um, water provision in, uh, in New York uh, City, and often with a sort of a three, a, a three to one ratio. So what's spent on conventional approaches uh, is three times the amount that would be spent on nature-based solutions. The real value added of nature-based solutions is working with conventional approaches. Mm. That's where you see the real opportunities arise. So it's not just a question of saying, oh, we can displace uh, engineered solutions with nature-based solutions. It's the promise lies in bringing these together. So if NBS have such transformative potential, why aren't states and organisations using them more, you know, to increase energy efficiency? We, uh, together with the University of Oxford, did a study looking at all the uh, nationally determined contributions, what countries will commit to the Paris Agreement. Two-thirds of those countries have built in 
nature-based solutions. We've seen nature-based solutions roll out in, uh, with respect to forest landscape restoration. 170 million hectares have been committed since uh, 2011. Stuart, where in the world are NBS the best used? I don't know, are there specific areas? Is it just a developing country tool? Some of the really encouraging action we're seeing around cities is in Europe. Some of the really interesting uh, action we're seeing around land management and security of, on rural livelihoods is in Africa. But equally, we're also seeing investments in, in rural jobs in the United States. So I think that is the really interesting thing with nature-based solutions. It is flexible, it, nature's everywhere, mm -hmm. and it works with the benefits that nature provides for people, and it says, right, how can we actually shape those in a sustainable way to help us solve these big problems that we're faced with? Thanks, Stuart. Still ahead on sustainable energy, we head over to the Netherlands to see how nature-based solutions are being used to help combat damaging coastal issues such as flooding. Can nature provide solutions to coastal issues? We'll head to the Netherlands, a country with long experience with the management of sea level rise. EcoShape CEO Hank Nibor believes that it's not just a task for engineers. His non-profit foundation assists coastal construction companies and helps restore nature at the same time. Take a look. My father was a sailor, my grandfather was a sailor, and I choose to be a hydraulic engineer. My mission is to promote uh, the use of nature-based solutions in the hydraulic engineering sector. Using nature-based solutions means that you will work with processes of nature to fulfill the function required by humans. That is uh, the core of nature-based solutions. If you look at the system here, for instance, the Ames-Dollard estuary, it's one of the great natural uh, areas on the edge of uh, sea and land in the Netherlands. As a civil engineer, I used to work on constructions like this one, eh? dikes with asphalt protection. If you want to strengthen it, you would have to take out all this asphalt, raise it and asphalt it again. It's very expensive. Now we have strengthened it by creating this salt marsh, which during storms will break the waves apart from uh, yeah, contributing to the flood uh, defense. A salt marsh like this also creates multiple benefits for nature, recreation, etc. You can see the plants that we put in it. This plant is able to survive in these salt conditions. And it also contributes to the to stabilization of this uh, mudflat. Profitability and sustainability are not a contradiction. They can certainly work together. We have to work with nature. And the sand we uh, see here in our salt marshes are from an other project. And we are uh, reusing the sand here instead of dumping uh, it in the North Sea. We get a win-win situation. Nature-based solutions uh, from a contractor perspective are uh, uh, an interesting uh, uh, niche market that could develop in the coming uh, years. That's also uh, uh, why as a company uh, and also why all the partners uh, within EcoShape are investing in nature-based solutions. The Indonesian uh, project uh, is uh, a nice example that is uh, triggered by uh, land subsidence with respect to uh, sea level rise. What we're trying to do in Indonesia is to uh, restore the mangrove greenbelt that was originally there, but also to involve the local communities in establishing that mangrove greenbelt that is uh, sustainable on the long term. We need to preserve those systems, but we also could uh, take a look at where to apply these systems where they are not yet there. Look at this situation. Uh, you have to realize that this was all land before. And in order to draw down the water levels, this secondary channel was created. And some people even had to move to give up their house. For instance, like the lady that we are going to meet here. And this is our outzicht. The river is, is coming too high. When there were houses, the houses were underwater. Now there's more 
room for the river, and it's nice to see. So the secondary channel is also a great opportunity for the ecology of the river. If you take nature into account, work with nature instead of against nature, you can see that you can have great results. And this makes me very confident. We are ready uh, to contribute to that by developing more knowledge so that everybody can use it uh, to create their own nature-based solutions. Harnessing the forces of nature to benefit the environment, the economy and the society may not be a far-fetched possibility. Let's head back to Stuart Maganis and see what the future holds. Well, Stuart, you mentioned energy efficiency. How can NBS actually improve access uh, to provide affordable and clean energy for all? Try and say we've got to replace uh, we've got to replace everything with, but rather actually seeing the complementarity mm -hmm. with MBS and, and other measures. Um, already, we've seen the European Union invest something like 180 million euros in encouraging and developing green cities because there's a recognition that this is part of a strategy to actually ensure that there is a sustainable energy future and, and that we can use clean energy that it is accessible to everyone, but also that we use it well. It's when we should be actually first users, first resort in city planning. I would absolutely <laughs> agree with that, yes. And, and, and I think, to be fair to several municipalities, mm -hmm. they are starting to realise that. There is, I'm very encouraged, there's a lot of interest in, within the European Union at the minute to see how nature-based solutions can be incorporated into city planning and green solutions there. Stuart, what would be the right conditions for NBS to work in a highly effective manner? For an NBS to be effective, it needs to be deployed at scale. It needs to be integrated into several policies. It can't just be left on its own. It's got to be built into agriculture, transport, etc. And it's got to link with um, other solutions. It's not an alternative, it is a complement and it really reinforces and helps deliver on the, those solutions. But most importantly, most importantly, nature-based solutions to be effective needs to work with and, and deliver for the target communities and work with those who will be delivering it. If it's imposed from the top down, nature-based solutions won't get started. If nature-based solutions is built on a real need of communities to address their challenges, working with farmers to help them put the, those in place, for example, mm -hmm. then nature-based solutions really does take off. And, and that's not theory. We know that from practice. Stuart, how do you see the world in the future if NBS is successfully implemented? When nature-based <laughs> solutions are successfully implemented, we will see transformed landscapes and indeed we'll see transformed cities as well. We will see this will integrate with um, uh, other economic activities, with farming, with uh, infrastructure. It will be part and parcel of our cities. And nature-based solutions will be not at a peripheral level, but will be mainstream, will be considered in people's consciousness. And it's here that I really see young people being able to take up and drive nature-based solutions. They will be part and parcel of moving the nature-based solutions uh, forward. Because of that, and because these young people will be voting, politicians will then have to pay attention to that. And so we will see nature-based solutions reflected in policies, reflected in national economic accounts. In short, nature-based solutions will be mainstreamed across the economy. Looking forward to that. Thank you, Stuart. <laughs> Thank you very much. So tell me, how was your journey through this show? I hope you enjoyed watching this first episode as much as we did creating it. Connect with us on Twitter at CNBC Energy using the hashtag Sustainable Energy. And again, I'm free to guide you for this new season as we draw the curtain back to reveal researchers and innovators who are actors of nature-based solution, our central theme this year. Now it's your turn to act for cleaner energy and a greener planet. See you soon.